almost a year ago, when the lovely coming to the city at King's Cross won the BAM uh, Mosaic of the Year Award in 20, 2012. Sadly, we'll have to let go of the rain later tonight. <laughs> but a year has passed, and I would, what I, I'm going to share a couple of other projects with you this afternoon and also talk you through the way we work, how the Spear Arts Academy came about, how it operates, and sort of just share a sneak peek with you into our operations and what we do in, in Cape Town and the heart of Africa. Africa, and specifically South Africa, has a rich heritage of hand, handcraft and handwork, um, where a lot of people, not necessarily for an income, but, but work with their hands. And, but there's a, a real opportunity for people to work with their hands and, and earn an income as well, seeing that the unemployment rate is so incredibly high. A group of um, African women worked in a curator's living room for a couple of years, um, be using glass beads, strung them on, on strings and stuck them with cold glue on, on boards and made these beautiful pictorial scenes of sort of an African heritage. And then the curator realised that if she sort of guided this group of women into a new realm, they could use the same skill but work and collaborate with fine artists and create work that are signature works of fine arts with, with, um, with artists. So they just realized their work for them in, in beads. And then from very pictorial, almost naive like African art, became beautiful artworks created. And all of those are indeed created with glass beads. These were shown at the Johannesburg Art Fair last year and then moved on to Maison Rouge in Paris earlier this year. So elevating the, the art of craft into the realm of contemporary art. And that's how Spear Architectural Arts and the Spear Arts Academy came about. That if, because beading and mosaics share a, a similar principle where you use a lot of different elements to create, create a whole. But mosaics, the possibility of using mosaics and, and stone are just much more unlimited in, in scope and scale and durability where, and where you put them in location, indoors or outdoors. So this, the same curator thought, well, if we could realize these beautiful artworks in beads, what can we do if we use stone? And that was the driving force to set the Spear, or to establish the Spear Arts Academy. Now, in its fifth year, the academy offers employment-based training for, for a group of people training in the art of mosaic. It's set at the foot of, of Table Mountain in Cape Town. That is actually a view out of our studio. It wasn't taken out of a tourist magazine. And on your left-hand side, that is our studio. So if we can recruit anyone to come and work with us um, that should be the enticing factor. The Academy offers a three-year full-time apprenticeship. It's sponsored. Um, apprentices don't have to pay a cent, and they do receive a stipend to cover their basic living costs. The, the, the program is comprehensive. It includes studio work, which is practical, but also supported with theor theoretical training in a range of subjects, mathematics, mosaic theory, applied mosaic theory, color theory, history of art, drawing, and most importantly, business skills, with the objective that the, the day that the apprentices um, graduate and leave after three years, that they can start their own businesses. It's in, there isn't really an industry of mosaic in, in South Africa, and where would you send your CV to when you, when you graduate as a mosaic artist? And I think maybe across the world there's sort of a similar, um, there isn't really an industry where you say, okay, well, the moment you graduate, oh, I can go and work there, there, and there. So the, the, the objective is that people get skilled and really empowered through, through the course that they can run their own business and employ others the day they leave. The program is structured over three years, where the first year is 
a, a foundation year where the students do classical training. It's based on the mo um, model of the Italian mosaic school in Spilimbergo. And our Italian or our, our studio master did study there as well. So the first year is, is, is a classical training. So students get the, the basics under their belt with, before they start experimenting in their second and third year. Second and third year runs as professional studios where students work on commissions and with deadlines. All evaluations are connected to, to their performance as well. And then second and third year, these commissions or smaller artworks are self-initiated and much more contemporary. So from learning the, the basics in your first year, second and third year is about starting to, to break the rules and start to experiment in much more of a contemporary way. These are just a couple of examples of work that's, that came out of the second and third year studios. And these artworks are roughly about one and a half meters each. And a rich use of material and, and color as well. We, we endeavor to use a lot of natural material as South Africa has a rich resource of natural stone. And then for very bright splashes of color, we do import large quantities of Italian smalty. <laughs> they didn't ask me to say that. Apprentices graduate at the end of the three years. We, the school has seen eight graduates. Funnily enough, the, third, the first group was five women, the second group three men, and the, the group that will graduate at the end of this year is a bit, uh, uh, um, three is, is a, a mixed bunch. These students have indeed set up their own studios. Um, they're not employing anyone at the moment. They're sort of starting to to find their feet, but they still work out of our, our premises. So we still provide a nurturing environment for, for ex-graduates to, to run these outsourced studios of theirs and, and, and work with us as well. When we work on large commissions, which I'll show you in a minute, we always do need extra skilled hands, and then they're close by. The program gets fed by an, a very active recruitment campaign. Initially, the program was aimed at previously disadvantaged aspiring artists. And as the program became more successful, established and, and known, the intake is much more varied. There's no prerequisite. Um, you just need to have the commitment to commit for a three-year full-time program. You don't have to have finished school, you don't need any previous qualification, um, you don't have to have any artistic background, but our entrance examination is quite strenuous. So students are sort of screened through uh, entrance examination to, so that we can gauge um, whether they will be suitable or not. Applications are open for the recruitment for 2014 and it actually close on Monday if anyone's still interested. You did see the view of Table Mountain, so you might be. And that's just a picture of one of our open days, where initially when we had an open day, we were worried that no one's gonna arrive. And then there was this flood of people through the studio with a great buzz. And then it's a real boost for the apprentices as well, because they take pride in what they do and they show people around and, and they sort of on show on the day, so that's a fantastic way to show the rest of Cape Town what we do. And where we're located, it's called The Fringe. It's sort of on the side of, of the East City in Cape Town. So, uh, quite a, a previously derelict area, I think similar to, to what the East End and, and Shoreditch was a couple of or years ago, and it's starting to regenerate, and all the creative industries are starting to move into it. It's still a bit, a bit more affordable. And with Cape Town being awarded World Design Capital for next year. We're very excited about the buzz and attention that will be drawn to, to, to our city and hopefully we can feed off the energy and vibe off of that. Those are our current first years. Still all very bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. <laughs> and that brings us to um, Spear Architecture Arts. Spear, the Spear Arts Academy is the 
the, the educational academic side of things. Westby Architecture Arts is the mother company that, that nurtures the Spear Arts Academy, but also the more the production, the production studio that manages and, and oversees large scale, the large scale projects that we do. Our sort of our line is that Spear Architecture Arts collaborates with fine artists, designers, architects, creatives to manufacture, install, conceive of large scale and site specific work in a range of mediums, not only in mosaic. So we've done work in graffiti, we've done work in ceramic, we've done large public sculpture works, and then obviously in mosaic as well. And for the purpose of today, I'll show you a project that we've done in mosaic. And I think that I started the, the presentation with the art of collaboration, and that's something that's very close to our heart, and I think at the core of our business as well, that we never attempt anything on our own. We always collaborate with an artist or with a designer on a project to, and realize the projects for them. So the integrity of the designer and the artist always stays true to our, to our heart, so that we realize a signature, a signature artwork for the specific designer. And I think when you start collaborating, the, the whole is always more than the sum of its parts, and that's where all the energy is unlocked. So hopefully everyone knows this by now, but I'll quickly run through that. that this is coming to the city, the 3 by 80 or 3 by 16 meter mosaic commissioned by Nando's UK in the King's Cross Nando's in London. Nando's has a, a, a very big support of, of South African art, and they actually have the biggest collection of, of South African art outside of the country. So a, a, a big lot of African art ships to Nando's stores on, on a monthly basis. All the work on their walls are original South African art. And they wanted a flagship piece for the King's Cross store. So we collaborated with acclaimed South African artist Clive van der Berg to design this magnificent piece. So this, the idea of King's Cross and the idea of being site specific was very important for the artist. So he did a lot of investigation about what King's Cross, sort of the heritage and, and of King's Cross and, and what happened there and the millions of people from all over the world that sort of flood or arrive at King's Cross on a train, seeing there was a train terminus from the 1850s, I believe. And so he started representa representing I these different identities from all over the world in binary code. So all those zeros and one numbers that you see are actually representational of, of these millions of, of lives that, that run through. So the artwork captures the experiences of all the people arriving in London. And, and I think the energy as well, there's, a great, there's always a great energy when you arrive in London. There's a, I'll show you this. No, it's working. Let's try again. Mosaic is every surface, every image made by small little pieces when each piece don't mean anything, but the whole thing means something. That's the, the, the scientific you know, meaning of mosaics. Every time we get a new design, I think, wow, this is the best design we've ever had. And that, I really feel that about Clive's work. The work that we've created and the way that we've interpreted it is just phenomenal. It's the best work we've ever done. It's very intelligent, there's a lot of different ways to think and it's all made by numbers and, and you're, it's, it's, you, you feel it, you feel just like, you know, okay, I'm arriving to the city, you feel that meaning, you, 
the different kind of people and, and the informatic thing is playing a big role. First thing in my mind when I saw the design was like, yeah, this design is crazy. Because there are like numerous different styles in this job. I do find that mosaic is kind of interesting, you know, because you learn things every day. Dwelling on the aspect of what I see every day, emotions and stuff, you know, just putting it out there, like trying to make people relate to what I see and conveying a message, you know, because I think the message is what stays on forever. I've got that big feeling that's inside me. Like sometimes I think that I might go crazy one day because I think of things that, that people never seen before. Like an art piece is something that the person has never seen before, but an artist brings it in front of him so that you would see it. I love this thing. The way I see this thing, it shows me that one day I'm going to design house of all Just by this thing. This thing is my future, this thing is my career. Ten artists worked for nine months, tallying 11,500 hours to complete coming to the city. That was only in our studio. It weighed two, it weighs two tons, and then it was shipped in, in panels to the site and installed by, by a team on this side. And if you haven't seen it in person, please do so. And then have a piece of chicken as well. And you can see on sort of middle to your left hand side, there's a little Chinese figure and that's a beaded figure as well to, to celebrate the, the heritage or the, the inception of the bead ladies and how they inspired the studio to, do, to move on to greater things. 40% of the material in coming to the city was made in our ceramic studio. We've got a ceramic studio as well. So all the numbers and some of the material was made specifically for the piece. Moving on to the dying slave. A visit to the winelands in South Africa is a reminder that not all fine artworks are exhibited on the walls of museums or galleries, but some of it could be found in the public realm, realm and outside. Located at a crossing of, of two pedestrian paths, this art, artwork is visible from both approaches. It's on the Spear Wine Estate, and the one approach leads from the conference center and the other one from the hotel. So it receives quite a lot of foot traffic on a daily basis and acts as a, as a beacon and a, a wayfinding mechanism. The design is based on Michelangelo's well-known figure of a male slave in the ecstatic throes of dying. The artwork has an inverse of the same image has been used on both sides, but the one is a positive image and the other one is a negative image. So the artwork is viewed from, from both sides. So as you approach, there's always an interesting side. There's a picture of in studio. It's sort of, it, it's, it's massive, broken up into nine columns. It, it, it's, each column is 4.2 meters high, so substantially higher than, than a figure. So it has the size of a billboard, and it questions identity, and identity in sort of the digital age and inform, information age we live in. So the artist worked in a digital medium. He provided us with a, a digital print out of how he manipulated a photograph of the slave that he took a photograph of. And it questions how access to information is, whether it sort of helps us along or not. And everything's done in quite muted natural stone colors with these very bright striped bands running through. And it's as if that's the noise in the information age that we have and whether all this information that we exposed to, maybe it's just making a lot of noise in our heads. 
that's doing installation. So the collaboration goes further than only working with artists, but doing projects on this scale and in, in an outdoor environment as well, you have to collaborate with architects, engineers, structural contractors, a lot of other people to get projects like this off the ground. There's the team installing the panels. And it's a great interactive piece. When you view it from afar, it lines up perfectly. There's a vantage point about 60 meters from it that it looks, it appears like a solid artwork. And then as you approach, and, and even just a, one step forward, then it starts breaking up and you start um, seeing the depth of it. And then from this side, it almost appears weightless as the design and the detailing of the structural work ends in thin fins, so very solid from the front and, and almost weightless from the side. There's an almost perfect image. Where it, it's fantastic to, to view from afar, but also very interesting from up close, because then the image disappears and, and the interest starts being just on the use of color and the use of stone. That brings us to the Wayfarer. A big insurance company in Johannesburg commissioned us to do a site-specific work for their new headquarters. Um, the headquarters will, would have been, or is now, it's already built, but when they started planning it, it was to house 3,000 employees in one building. We collaborated and or then we sort of thought to ourselves, well, this is a fantastic commission. You sort of get a, a blank slate. They, they gave us renderings and said, well, this is, it's a central atrium. It, it's a four-story high atrium, a fantastic space. The artwork will be against a, a mammoth off-shot of concrete wall. What do you do? Who, who do you ask to work with on such a fantastic project? And then we thought, well, we're going to be a bit naughty and, and ask sort of the the naughtiest artist around to do something that shouldn't be naughty. And he, he was very um, frazzled by it because his name is Conrad Boertes and he's, he's a South African artist, but he works in a very iconic way. He's, he's well known for quite satirical work. And, but we said you have to do something that could be viewed in, in a public audience as well. So initially he had stage fright and said, well, that's my trademark. I can't do something that's not, that's not offensive. And he said, well, it, it can't be offensive in a very offensive way because it's 3,000 people will see it on a daily basis. And you have to, to get all our apprentices to work on it. So you have to, to, to be proud of it. And his, his satire is often directed at South Africa politics, society, and, and religion. And I think then he took some inspiration from what an insurance company could, could mean in society. But more about that later, I wanted to explain how we work. So when we approach an artist, they'll, we'll, we'll discuss the design development, go through a couple of stages, and then they'll they'll provide us with an artwork. So on the left-hand side, because he is a painter, he provides us with a canvas to scale of what the, the final one or the final design would be. Then we'll sample very important areas of the design and discuss that with him. He'll sign it off and then production would take place. On your right-hand side, that is the way Ferret taking shape in our, on our studio floor. So the, art, the artwork features a colossal central figure, which is actually a self-portrait of the artist, that stands in a land that dominates the landscape that he's standing in. And the landscape is populated with these diminutive anarchic fi um, figures that sort of running amok. Some of them are killing each other, bumping their heads against tree trunks. The one is stealing money. And I wonder whether that was a social commentary on, on insurance companies. But then his entire body is covered with, with tears, and that indicates the artist's preoccupation with a troubled state that of our current existence. Yet, the, the artist placed this um, central figure 
surrounded with, with rays of light shining or radiating from sort of his heart position um, out. And the artist sees this as a life free and unbounded by the constraints and of limited and indoctrinated ways of thinking values inherited from our forefathers. So he says that the wayfarer is the one that shows the way forward and you shouldn't, be feel, you shouldn't feel bounded with what happened in the past. And it's, it's, I think especially in a South African context as well. And then rather look forward and, and take it from there. That's the piece installed on location. And that was a mammoth task, just getting it there. 50 crates transported to Johannesburg. A team of, that's a close-up. A team of five installers had to carry every single piece of, of mosaic, more or less, a me, we work in pages of more or less a meter by a meter, depending on the design. They had to carry it all up, up all the way to the top of the scaffolding. I could only go to about level three. And then everything started being very blurry and I had to go down. But that, they spent two weeks on site and installed it all themselves and did a fantastic job. And then I want to read a, a comment that the artist, um, a quote of the artist about the collaboration. And he says, creating a commissioned painting to be translated into a massive mosaic work was a first for me. Not only have I never been part of a, such a project before, but, I, I, but also was this the first time I had to hand over the artwork to be interpreted on such a large scale. I was simply not sure whether it would be a success in the end. I had the privilege to witness the metamorphosis of a work on canvas into a full-scale 3D work on this mosaic studio floor. Looking at the work laid out on the floor from a ladder, I tried to envisage what it would be like to, to walk around in a large space and look at it from different angles. But nothing came close to the experience of witnessing the piece after it was installed in situ. It has such a pulsating intensity that I could never have predicted. I think that all the months of incredible hard work by all those involved paid off to create something that is truly unique and incredibly rich and powerful, which was a very good, great compliment for us. And lastly, I want to talk about what we've done very recently. The reason why I'm freshly off the plane is that we launched an exhibition at the Johannesburg Art Fair on Thursday night, and that was a very big accomplishment for us as the, sort of the question of where does mosaic art fit in, or where does it lie? And we took, a, I think, after last year's BAM, where the whole conversation started, whether mosaic art should be in the Tate or not, we thought, well, we're going to pitch a project for the art fair, for, it's a contemporary art fair in Johannesburg, with all international eyes on it as well, so the best of the best is there. And they offered us the central space at the fair. So we, and then we only, we didn't propose anything and then we set our own brief and said, well, what can we display at this fair that would really set the bar for what could be done on a grand scale with mosaics and how can we show Johannesburg, South Africa and the rest of the world of what sort of the way forward could be for the medium. Vertical aerial... Then we collaborated with Gareth Marx. He's a sculptor in, in, in Cape Town. So Vertical Area is, is a freestanding sculptural mosaic artwork composed of 56 panels mounted on a rectangular steel frame with a compound angle. This is a shot in the studio. And what he, it is, the artist didn't do an artwork in itself. He saw the collaboration and the making of the artwork as his input as well. So he designed the shape of it and then provided us with an aerial photograph of inner city Johannesburg and said, well, we, we'll divide it into panels and then just start making. Timeline was incredibly tight. So we had an open call for participation worldwide and got about 20 or 30 applications and then had four 
Italian mosaic artist joining our studio for a period of two months, which was incredibly helpful, because the speed that they worked at was so fast that we could have never imagined that someone could do that. We set deadlines for everyone, and then the one guy just um, completed his deadline that was supposed, he was supposed to take five days to do it, and he completed it in a day. So the entire studio started working at an incredible pace just to keep up with each other. So it was such an inspiring situation for our apprentices as well to work alongside professional people and to see how it is done in the real world. There's the artist on the panels lying out and he says, an aerial view is both a photograph and a map. As a photograph, it functions in a sort of scientific manner. It is literally an overview. As a map, the aerial view interests me because of the manner in which one reads a map particularly a map without text. And it was sort of, it, w it was quite strange that a, a bunch of mosaic artists worked in Cape Town and built Johannesburg. And, uh, and then four Italian artists also built Johannesburg, Tessera for Tessera, and never saw Johannesburg. But I think they know it off by heart. So if they ever found themselves within downtown Joburg, they'll know exactly where they are. And that's a close-up of it. But the, the panels were all framed in steel frames and then put on a large structural steel ca rib cage that was, that was sort of the inner core that was cladded in these panels to form this, the, the sculptural work. Those were the panels before the mosaic came in, and we did a, a test shot or a test installation at the engineer's manufacturing studio just to see whether it stood up, and then had another test run with all the mosaic panels inside to see whether the three ton structure still stood up with all the material inside before taking it all down again and transporting it to Johannesburg. That was a test run of what it looked like the night before it went to Johannesburg. And so you can see that it, it's lit, it literally is a folded piece of paper that balances itself. So on the inside, it feels like Johannesburg is it, it's sort of folding over you. In the back, it's sort of pushing you out, and very much like a, sort of this feeling that you get in a lot of cities. And that was opening night. And it literally was a talk of the town. And then I would just like to show you a video of how we made it. What's in the future? Spear Architectural Arts does site-specific artworks on a grand scale that are integrally part of the design of a building. They are conceived for a specific site to integrate with the environment, the community and, and the artist is chosen for matching the ethos of the place. It's not often that you do pieces of this magnitude. Scale really, really does work uh, to, to, to the public's eye. I think I'm overwhelmed and I uh, feel so honored. And uh, coming to look at the actual work, I didn't have anything to add. It's just like to have discussions with the team. What do you think of that? It goes back to the way I work, you know, the way I, I do collage, I mean, I do distortions, I do black and white versus color. So I think even their interpretation, the way they've done it, it sort of like works and balances the whole thing, you know, rough edges against softness and then, so yeah, I mean, it's overwhelming.
to be honest. This piece is freestanding, two-dimensional panels that you can view from both sides, balancing on itself. Gerard being a sculptor, who is very afraid with large-scale public artworks, we thought would be able to handle the technical aspects. We were also keen to work with an artist whose work is very graphic and not so reliant on colour. And then, of course, with any large-scale project, you want to work with somebody who loves the collaboration and who understands the basic principles of working together, deadlines and such. Also, great communicator and educator to our students who we want to connect with various professionals so that they get to learn the different styles of making a career of art. My work has dealt a lot with, with maps over the years. So what made perfect sense was looking at cityscapes and the way in which it tiles the, the landscapes. The initial project to me was, was about finding some way of working with mosaic that wouldn't involve simple translations. It's not simply about me making a painting or a drawing and getting the mosaic artist to translate it. So I wanted to find an image that would work with the idea of mosaic, but not only visually, but sort of with the conception of mosaic. Small fragments um, creating a, an image of a, a larger whole. To me, every time you work with a new medium, uh, the medium involves a sort of particular way of thinking. Certainly a lot of my work involves the relationship between fragment and whole. But mosaic offered a different type of approach, particularly the, the, the use of stone. What it's enabled me to do is to work in the same deliberate, precise, obsessive manner, but on a much larger scale. The idea with the structure was to somehow create a map that precariously holds itself up in the way that I think Joburg, in a sense, is a city that holding itself up always threatens to collapse, but at the same time is holding itself up, so there's this ambiguity. And so the structure is literally the map that's been folded on a diagonal in such a manner that, that the fold creates an angle that holds the structure up. The map, in this case, becomes something of architectural. It's an aerial photograph that looks down, but at the same time, we're inviting the viewer to look sort of into it in a way that one does with a painting. 